If we're not careful in the Christian life, we will put certain individuals on a platform or a pedestal, and we will look at them as really the consummate Christian, and then in response to uh, where we place them, we'll just always feel inadequate. And then sometimes in Christianity, if you're not careful, as you look at your brothers and sisters around you, it's careful, uh, we have to be careful to not look at Christianity or uh, being a Christian uh, here at church as a competitive sport. As we look at one person and say, well, uh, they're doing this, I think I'm going to top that by doing this. And if we're not careful with that mentality, then it seems like we're on this uh, endless quest uh, to get noticed more, to do a little better than somebody else. Notice in the book of Matthew, chapter number 11, and verse number 3, to me this is a very interesting passage. We've mentioned it before. And the Bible says in Matthew 11, and verse number 3, John the Baptist here had sent two of his disciples to Jesus and said unto him, Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another. Then notice in verse number 11 the response that Jesus gives to the disciples, and then in a general sense, he's just saying something about Jesus, about John the Baptist. Verily, of a truth I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding. He that is a least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, than John the Baptist. Father, help us as we look at your word. Uh, Lord, I don't want to speak tonight. I don't want to say a word. I simply want you to speak through your word. And I pray that you would help me just as a useful tool. Uh, Lord, I'm flesh. Uh, I fail. But I pray that you would help me tonight to speak your word with truth and with power. In your name, amen. Sometimes we look at Christianity and we have a tendency to put a person on a pedestal. Like maybe we put the pastor on the pedestal and, you know, the pastor, he ought to be, you know, more spiritual than I ought to be. Or we look at some other individuals and we say, well, that guy over there, he certainly must have everything all worked out. Or we get in this trap, as I mentioned already, uh, where we start trying to outdo each other in the Christian life and say, well, you know, if, uh, if they did this much, then I got to do more. And then we could make the mistake, Paul mentioned it, where we compare ourselves to each other. And generally that goes something like this. Well, you know, I know I did this and such, but at least I'm not like you know, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so over here because they do this and such all the time. And we give ourselves a license to sin or we give ourselves license to do less than our best. And Paul addressed that. He said, for we dare not make ourselves of the m a number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Now I want you to say this statement tonight because really it is in just two words, in a nutshell, it is what the message is about tonight. So I want you to repeat these words with me. Everybody, Everybody. struggles. Would you say that with me again? Everybody struggles. And we're not using this as a statement of excuse. Ah, pastor, you know, <laughs> nobody's perfect. And that's what some people will say as they live in conscious, conspicuous sin. And that's not right. That's not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is this mentality where we think that some folks have a higher level of Christianity or a higher level of spirituality than other people do. But the truth is, say the phrase with me, 
Everybody struggles. My dad used to say, that man, he puts his britches on the same way I do. Meaning that that individual has the same struggles in life that we all have. The scripture said, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Another statement my dad used to make, the flesh is the flesh, no matter whose bones it's hanging on. And I like that. The flesh is the flesh, no matter whose bones it's hanging on. In our mind, if we're not careful, we elevate certain people above a level of greatness, and we don't realize that we're doing that. And in doing so, for ourselves, we're making the Christian life unattainable. And we think somehow that the people in the Bible, they just breathe different air so that they live differently. And in doing that, we make achieving something great for God not achievable for us. In our text here tonight, I want you to notice that God called John the Baptist the greatest. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is far greater than he. And we could talk about John the Baptist and what a tremendous man he was. What a bold preacher of the gospel. And John the Baptist was thrown into prison because he lifted his finger up and he told, uh, he told the king, he said, hey, what you are doing is not right. For you to take your husband's wife to your own is not right. You're committing sin. And because of that, he was placed in prison and eventually was beheaded for preaching truth. And we could talk about all of the great things that John the Baptist did, but in the rest of this verse, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And Jesus was saying, hey, John the Baptist was great, but being great with God is available to you. That's what he said. Notice the what happened here, and I want you to see three things tonight. The first is this, even those in the scripture who we look at as heroes of the faith, they struggled with their faith. Even these Bible saints struggled with their faith. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, verse 2, and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do we remember who John the Baptist is? John the Baptist was a man who was struggling even though he had a very close relationship with the Lord Jesus. I want you to think about John the Baptist's privileges. John the Baptist was the very cousin of Jesus. He was flesh and blood related to Jesus. He was privileged to be the forerunner for the gospel. And he stood in the desert and he told of the coming of Jesus and he warned the nation of Israel of the coming Messiah. It was John that was honored to baptize Jesus. He had privilege. And notice John was there when that heavenly proclamation was made. Do you remember that? When God the Father said in a loud and audible voice, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We think, wait a minute, John. Do you remember when God from heaven gave the audible confirmation? You were there. He struggled, and he, dis he struggled despite the proofs. I want you to see it. Now, when John had heard in the prison, read the next four words with me aloud, the works of Christ. All John is getting from prison is these reports. Man, Jesus did this. Oh, did you hear Jesus did this? And despite that proof, despite the proclamation he heard from heaven, and despite the privilege that he had with that close connection with Jesus, 
John the Baptist is struggling in his faith. He's in prison on the edge of the Dead Sea. It is scalding hot. And I'm sure the heat inside that prison was just oppressive and lay on him like a lead coat. But yet, despite all that, John doubted. John struggled in his faith. Why? Well, there's a two-word answer for it. Would you say it with me? Because everybody struggles. Everybody. Number two, I want you to see not only do those in Scripture struggle sometimes with their faith, but I want you to see that sometimes great Christians struggle with fear. With fear. Paul, what I believe is one of the great missionaries since Jesus, a pioneer for the gospel, struggled with fear. You say, Paul struggling with fear? Paul was so bold, but he struggled with fear. Several passages show us that he struggled with his fear. Look in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. We'll start right at the beginning of the passage. So we have John the Baptist who struggles. He's doubting. He's struggling in his faith. Now I want you to see Paul, the great apostle, the great pioneer for the gospel, is struggling with a matter of fear. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And notice in verse number 1, And I, brethren... When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness. Read the next three words with me. And in fear and in much trembling, which oftentimes is associated with fear. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I'd like to read for you in the book of Ephesians. It says in uh, chapter number 6 and verse number 18, notice what Paul said. Paul said, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for the saints. And for me, Paul says, hey, I want you to pray for me. What is he asking for prayer for? Here it is. That utterance may be given unto me. He said, pray for me that I'll have enough boldness to open my mouth and give the gospel. That I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. That I therein may speak boldly as I ought. What's Paul saying here? He says, I get chicken sometimes. Do you? When you're given the gospel, be honest. Man, I do. I'm just like, oh man. Man. The other day I was uh, at the gas pump and... Uh, I knew I had a track in my truck and somebody was next to me. I'm like, ah, oh, they're almost finished anyways. I'm, I'm, I'm talking myself out of it. I said, no, I've got to give this guy a track. I gave it to him. I said, hey, I want to give you something. I said, I know you're busy right now, but I'd love for you to read this. It tells you what you need to know to get to heaven. And I was like, Phew, thank you, Lord. I just need boldness sometimes. Paul struggled with fear. He struggled despite his education. Paul was incredibly intelligent. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised in the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. And he's going on and on about his qualifications. And he said, I have these qualifications, but I don't put stock in this. 
Paul probably knew more about the scriptures than anybody else who was an apostle at his time. And he commended those who searched the scriptures. He quoted scriptures all the time. But Paul struggled with fear and intimidation and trembling. And Paul says, I have no confidence in my flesh. And he struggled despite his experiences. Did you know Paul stood before kings? He stood before Agrippa. And Paul performed miracles. It was Paul that struck a man blind in Acts 13. Do you remember Bar Jesus? He healed a blind man in Acts 14. He was stoned to death, came back from the dead in Acts 14. But here Paul says, despite my experiences, I still struggle with this matter of fear. And Paul struggled despite his endorsements. In Acts 13, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit himself called Paul. The local church and all the men there laid their hands on Paul because Paul was the one that God gave the nod to. Paul had full support and even despite all that, Paul says, sometimes I just feel inadequate. And I struggle with fear. Fear and trembling. Why did Paul struggle with fear? Why did John the Baptist struggle with his faith? Simple answer. Would you say it with me? Because everybody struggles. Just know that. I want you to get that down in your heart. You can do great things for God despite the difficulties that you have and don't think that somebody else is in a better position to do something for God because somehow they spiritually are on better ground. Friend, everybody struggles. Number three, everybody struggles with their flesh. Look in Romans chapter number seven. Romans seven. Thank you for turning your Bibles and following along. Romans seven and verse number 14. The scripture tells us here, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For that what I would, that, I, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. Now I know this is a little difficult as you read through this to kind of sort it all out. But Paul is just saying in a nutshell, the right things that I earnestly desire to do, sometimes those things I don't do. And Paul said, sometimes I say the things that I shouldn't say. I don't want to say those things, but sometimes in my flesh, I say those wrong things. Sometimes in my mind, the things that I don't want to think, or the things that I don't want to dwell on, though I don't want to, sometimes those are the things that I end up dwelling on. Sometimes the actions that I say, I'm not going to do this. Uh, David, I'm not going to do this. But then I find that those are the things that I end up doing. And that's what Paul is saying. He said that I allow not for what I would that do I not, but what I hate that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. And he said, all I do when I do the things that I know I don't want to do and I know I'm not supposed to do, all I'm doing is proving the fact that I'm a sinful man. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And remember the context that he says that in. For to will is present with me. He said, I say, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Or I'm going to do the right thing. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. He says, sometimes in my flesh, he's talking here on fleshly terms, in my flesh, I simply do not have the strength or the power to do what I'm supposed to do. For the good that I, that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that is... Uh, that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. And again, he's just stating, I know what the Bible says, and I know the right thing I'm supposed to do, 
But oftentimes when I'm walking in the flesh, I'm doing my fleshly desires instead of doing what God wants me to do. And notice the culmination of this discourse that seems a little convoluted because of the struggle that's back and forth. Verse number 24. Read aloud with me, O oh, wretched man that I am. How many have ever felt that way? O oh, Lord, how could I be coming? I mean, it's communion night tonight. And here I am. Communion night. And a month ago, when it was communion, I'm praying and asking the Lord to forgive me for the same thing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And I've heard some people say, you know, I think it would be better if I were dead because I wouldn't be doing these things anymore. But Paul doesn't end it there. He doesn't end it in a defeated note. <laughs> he gives us victory. Would you read with me verse 25? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And he gives us the answer for the question that he asks. Who delivers us? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. What's Paul saying? <laughs> Paul's saying that even great Christians struggle with their faith. Even great Christians struggle with fear. And even great Christians struggle with the flesh. In my estimation, Paul, one of the greatest Christians, but Paul is telling us that he struggles with his flesh. The bottom line is this, just because you struggle does not mean that you cannot overcome. Faith is the victory. Just because you have weak moments or just because you have failed, sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes you have a bad week. You say, Pastor, I've had a bad decade. Okay, all right, okay, we'll go with that. But the fact is, you still can live for God in His strength, and you still can please Him. Amen? Don't let your struggles define your Christian life. Face them, confront them, and say, Lord, in your strength we can. In your strength we can. Lifetime of labor is still worth.